Good evening, everyone. I will call the Ways and Means meeting this evening to order. Staff, if you would please call the roll. Assemblywoman Benitez Thompson. Here. Assemblyman Frierson. Here. Assemblywoman Gorlow. Here. Assemblyman Heathen. Here. Assemblywoman Howdigee. Here. Assemblyman Levitt. Here. Assemblywoman Miller. Here. Assemblywoman Monroe Moreno. Here. Assemblywoman Peters. Here. Assemblyman Roberts. Here. Assemblywoman Titus. Here. Assemblywoman Tolls. Here. Assemblyman Watts. Here. Chair Carlton. I'm here. Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to Ways and Means at Dusk. So with that, we have some bills in front of us this evening, but also we have some bill draft introductions. So on top of the 103 bills we already have, we're getting a few more. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Kaufman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, BDRS 1060 makes an appropriation to the Office of the Attorney General for the cost of replacing standard glass uh, windows and doors with ballistic glass and frame at the Carson City office and provided, provides other matters properly related thereto. So committee members, any questions? This is a bill draft introduction. Does not mean you support or oppose the bill. You're just voting to introduce the bill. I have a motion from Ms. Benitez Thompson, a second from Dr. Titus. Questions or comments? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any in opposition? Hearing no opposition, passes unanimously of the members present. Ms. Kaufman. Thank you, Madam Chair. The next BDR is S1126, and this makes various appropriations to the Department of Corrections for an upgrade to a uh, reintegration of certain management systems and for the replacement of cameras, storage area networks, and ovens and provides other matters properly relating thereto. And you said ovens, correct? O-V-E-N-S, okay. Ovens. I'm that used to correct. hardware and software and thing. I'm not used to ovens. We may have to check that one out. So with that, committee members, any questions or comments? Not hearing any, I have a motion from Ms. Vanitas Thompson, a second from Dr. Titus. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any in opposition? Hearing no opposition passes unanimously of the members present. Moving on. Thank you, Madam Chair. The next BDR is S1058, and this makes a supplemental appropriation to the Department of Conservation Natural Resources for an unanticipated shortfall in the forest fire suppression budget account and provides other pro matters properly related thereto. Thank you very much. Uh, we typically see this one every session, so with that, I have a motion from Ms. Bedinas Thompson, a second from Dr. Titus. Questions or comments on the motion? Not seeing any. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. And any in opposition? Hearing no opposition passes unanimously. The members present. Uh, did that complete our mission? Yeah, I'll, I'll sign them at the end and then we will get them introduced and send them right back to us. So with that, committee members, let's go ahead and start on our work for this evening. Our first bill that we have at this moment is Assembly Bill 61. I will go ahead and open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 61. Oh, and for the, the uh, viewing public certification, Assembly Bill 435 was withdrawn from Ways and Means this morning at or this morning at the floor session so that bill is no longer within our jurisdiction so that is off of our agenda assembly bill 61 i believe we have a representative from the attorney general's office available that's correct that's correct madam chair mark kruger chief deputy attorney general all right mr kruger so if you would just kind of give us a thirty thousand foot view of the bill we don't need to have a hearing on it um and just just give us a basic walkthrough and then we'll ask our questions please i'll be happy to madam chair um, and members of the committee real briefly ab61 um, seeks to amend the deceptive trade practices act and provide con certain consumer protections um, for the benefit of individuals and businesses in this state uh, the amendments seek to establish a price gouging prohibition during times of emergency, harmonize certain criminal penalties without the general uh, fraud, 
revise provisions related to administrative hearings, uh, modify the statute of limitations for certain violations of the Deceptive Trade Practice Act, increase penalties for robocalling, and provide other matters properly related thereto. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to note that I had a discussion with, um, I believe it was Sarah Kaufman, uh, regarding her fiscal concerns and why this bill ended up coming before this committee. Um, we believe we have a solution and we would move at this time to amend the bill to delete section 17.3, 17.6, and 17.9. By removing these provisions, um, that will address and satisfy the fiscal concerns uh, that were raised by Ms. Kaufman. Thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Ms. Kaufman to do our uh, standard walkthrough, and then we'll d we'll discuss that option and move on from there. So thank you very much, Ms. Kaufman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, sections 17.3 through 17.9 would transfer the authority and the registra uh, registration and regulation of credit service organizations from the Division of Mortgage Lending uh, of the Department of Business and Industry to the Consumer Affairs Division. It is uh, unclear if the uh, transfer of these responsibilities from the Mortgage Lending Division to the Consumer Affairs Division would create any additional duties related to the Consumer Affairs Division, which is a general funded account. So Ms. Kaufman, I, I, maybe I, I missed probably missed something there. So by deleting those sections, we would be transferring the duties back to where they came from? Uh, Madam Chair, um, by deleting those sections, uh, the uh, duties would be retained within the mortgage lending uh, division and there would be uh, no fiscal impact. Okay, all right, thank you very much. So with that, committee members, do you have any uh, questions of Mr. Kruger at this time? with his proposed amendment. Not seeing any questions from any committee members at this time. This is the hearing on Assembly Bill 61. Mr. Kruger, did you have anyone else that you would like to speak on this bill at this time? Madam Chair, not at this time. Okay. Thank you very much. So this being the hearing for Assembly Bill 61, we'll go ahead and open up the hearing. So we will uh, broadcast services. If we could go to anyone who may be in support of Assembly Bill 61. If you would like to testify in support, of AB 61, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, the testimony line is open and working. However, we have no callers to testify in support of AB 61. Thank you very much. Do we have anyone uh, in the queue for opposition? To testify in opposition to AB 61, Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, the testimony line is open and working. However, we have no one on the line to testify in opposition to AB 61. Thank you. Do we have anyone in neutral? To testify in neutral on AB 61, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, the testimony line is open and working. However, we have no one to testify in neutral on AB 61. Okay, thank you very much. I will go ahead and close the hearing on Assembly Bill 61. Making myself notes. So with that, Assembly Bill 61. The next bill, committee members, that we have scheduled at this time is Assembly Bill 149. 
Oh, thank you, Ms. Peters. We'll go ahead and roll that one towards the back. Thank you very much. We'll move on to others that are here. Um, we will, next bill that we will look at would be Assembly Bill 167. That's Mr. Levitt's. Okay, Mr. Levitt, you're in a holding pattern too. Thank you for your consideration. Uh, Assembly Bill 194 is, let's take a look here. It's Ms. Torres. So do we have someone here who's going to be presenting Assembly Bill 194? She's on her way. We will give her a moment. We did move quickly, so I'll give her a break. Here she comes. Good evening, Ms. Torres. Please come on up to the testimony table. And you, when you are ready, please introduce yourself and proceed. Good evening. Thank you, Chair Carlton and members of the Committee on Ways and Means. For the record, I'm Assemblywoman Selena Torres, and I proudly represent Assembly District 3. And this evening, I will be presenting AB 194, which revises provisions governing suspension and expulsion. Clearly, I ran over here. I apologize. <laughs> A little out of breath. <laughs> I wanted to make sure I made it to the hearing on time. <laughs> Schools have the responsibility to provide students with due process. Education is a right afforded to Nevadans. In the U.S. Supreme Court case, Goss v. Lopez indicates that the right to a free and public education cannot be withdrawn on grounds of misconduct, absent fundamentally fair procedures to determine whether misconduct had occurred. Nevada students do not shed their constitutional rights at the doors of our schools. Education is a property and liberty interest. Both Goss v. Lopez and Brown v. Board of Education established that students have the due process under the 14th Amendment, no matter how arbitrary the incident. This legislative body has a responsibility to ensure that due process is clear in statute and in regulation. The legislation does not seek to outline what due process will look like in Nevada schools. Rather, the legislation seeks to require that the Nevada Department of Ed release its guidance on what this appeals process should look like and what the timeline should look like. I believe that the fiscal note is in reference to section 7 of the bill on page 9. The committee will note that the language requiring the Department of Education to provide guidance to school districts regarding the appeals process in as many languages as possible. My understanding from my conversations with the Nevada Department of Ed is that this fiscal note is intended to ensure that they have the funds available to translate this document into as many languages as possible. Thank you, Chair Carlton and committee members for considering AB 194. I now stand open to any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Torres. I'll turn it over to Ms. Kaufman very briefly and stay right there because there might be questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Department of Education provided a fiscal note of $31,214 in fiscal year 2022 and $578,000 in fiscal year 2023, which primarily consists of translation services of $27,200 and staff time to develop and con uh, conduct the public workshops which is approximately uh, $4,000 in fiscal year 2022 and $578 in fiscal year 2023. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Torres, did you have any further conversations with the Department of Ed about their fiscal note? Yes, I did. And they said that it was just pertaining to the translation services. Um, but I will note to the committee that the language in the legislation as is, is permissive language. It's not compulsive. It's not requiring them to provide it in every single language. Um, but my understanding from the Nevada Department of Ed is that they would like to, and that's why the fiscal note is, is there. I'm not sure if there's anybody present. I know that they, I believe that there might be available. Okay, we'll, we'll call, up, call them up in just a moment. Um, by, by any chance, was there any conversation with be, that between the, as far as you know of, with our new Office of New Americans to be able to have them help do some of the translation services to help alleviate some of the costs? Not to, uh, not to my uh, understanding. Okay. All right. Thank you. So do I have someone from the Department of Education available? If you would introduce yourself, please. Thank you, Chair Carlton. This is Sarah Nick on behalf of the Nevada Department of Education for the record. And thank you so much to the woman Torres who was able to work with us on this fiscal note. For reflection, uh, the fiscal note is accurate. Um, 
regarding section seven and eight that the department feels these services are very important and necessary um, and should be translated into as many languages as possible. And, and if I could ask, how do you currently handle translation um, in other areas? Thank you, Chair Carlton. This is Sarah for the record from Nevada's Department of Education. Um, to date, we have not had a translation request of this size. Um, for example, the reports that would be translated, we're estimating at 2,000 words. And typically, if we do any translation services, it is a paragraph or less than a page. Thank you very much. It's it's good information to have. And the comment that I made earlier, um, would the department consider partnering with the Office of New Americans to possibly be able to lower the cost of these translation services since we do have that new department available to all the other departments in the state? Thank you, Chair Carlton. This is Sarah Nick for the record, Nevada Department of Education. Yes, I will reach out to the Office of New Americans to make sure that we're looking at any cost reductions as available. I will note that our fiscal note using 17 cents a word, I believe that is already from the rate negotiated by the Office for New Americans. And thank you very much. It's a great answer. So with that, uh, Ms. Benitez Thompson. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I appreciate that. So. Uh, we know that in some of the, the federal dollars we've been getting, there are dollars um, that we've, we've talked about the need for translation desperately in these budgets and been enthusiastic about trying to get as much as we can translated um, and knowing that that's just such a great investment dollar. So I guess as we look towards getting more into the habit of making sure that documents are translated, I know you guys were focused on forward-facing documents. Does this meet part of that criteria of being a forward-facing document that, that could be in that plan for translation? Or did you already have specific documents in the queue um, and, and this wouldn't, would, for some reason, couldn't be one of those? Thank you, Majority Leader. Chair Carlton, through you to the Majority Leader, this is Sarah Nick for the record, Nevada Department of Education. Um, yes, as the department looked at what potential funds could be available, it's important to note that federal relief funding would be related to COVID-19 forward-facing documents. And as the department reads Assembly Bill 194, this is related to discipline and restorative justice, which is very important and needs to be funded for translation. Um, and in terms of making sure that going forward, we're supplying more and more translative services. I think this is a really great bill to start with. I I appreciate that. Thanks so much, Madam Chair. And my my ears are already muffled and things are coming through muffled, but I think I got the, got the gist that the grants are gonna be specifically for COVID-19 documents. And I think that's actually helpful to hear because I don't think that I necessarily picked up on that when we were reviewing those, um, the, those dollars that were coming when we were talking about translation services and forward-facing documents that they're specific to COVID-19 because I think we were all hoping that so much more could be translated than, than maybe what I was thinking. So I'll, I'll temper my expectations, I guess. And, and that was one of the things that I was looking at too. I, I was under the impression that ESSER dollars might be able to be used for this. So I think that's something we should s still keep in, in the backs of our minds as we move forward and do a little bit more an investigation on that. So I believe uh, Assemblyman Roberts had a question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and my question was just in line with the majority of leaders and yours is I just remember the other day hearing in our education subcommittee that we were allocating a certain amount of uh, CARES Act dollars to translation. And I was hoping that we would be able to leverage some of those to offset the physical note that the education uh, has put on this. So I, I think we beat it up pretty good and hopefully we can apply some of that to this. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. We're kind of all thinking in the same pathway here. So with that, committee members, are there any other questions of Ms. Torres or the Department of Education at this time? Ms. Peters. Thank you, Chair. I just have a comment related to um, the expectation of increased delinquency and behavioral issues that may come in from students being out of the classroom for so long. And I would argue that those are COVID related issues. And if this can be directed towards those students and particularly their families who may be home and 
less um, and have greater language barriers, I would be inclined to say that it does fit that model. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, Ms. Tolles. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you again for this legislation. It's my second time getting to hear it uh, from Education Committee to Ways and Means. And I'm just wondering, is there any language in here that says that you can accept gifts or grants to fulfill the, the um, requirements of this legislation? And I'm also... And maybe I could get that answer from our policy analyst, but um, my other question would be, in regards to the, um, if we could get creative and work with ENCHI, for example, some of our foreign language departments to help with the translations. I, I don't know if that's an appropriate question to ask, but if there's ways to get around this, thanks. Thank you, Assemblyman Torres, for the record. Um, so my understanding is that the Nevada Department of Education does have the ability to accept those grants already, although you know, I'm more than happy to add that language into here uh, if necessary, but I will remind the committee that the language in the bill already is permissive. Um, and so therefore, like right now, there. Like my understanding is that you know it's to the extent possible, um, and so we can add more language for them to accept gifts and grants. But I imagine that the Nevada Department of Education does have the ability to do so, um, and there's nothing in this legislation that hinders their ability to create those partnerships with um, the Office of New Americans, Norn Enchi, or the other offices that already exist. Um, and so you know, obviously, I think uh, we should prioritize the two predominantly, the predom most predominant languages in our state, which is. Um, you know, other than English would be Spanish and Tagalog. Um, but, you know, I, I think that it's great that the Nevada Department of Education is starting to look at how we can ensure language access for every Nevadan. Any other questions from any other committee members at this time? Not seeing any. Thank you very much, Ms. Torres. Um, and to the Department of Ed, do you have anyone else you wanted to? Uh, have come up and speak, or that's good? Okay. With that, this is the hearing on Assembly Bill 194. So with that, we will open it up for those in support. Broadcast services, do we have anyone in support for Assembly Bill 194? To testify in support of AB 194, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, the testimony line is open and working. However, we have no one to testify in support of AB 194. Anyone in opposition, please? To testify in opposition to AB 194, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, one, two, zero. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Stephen Cohen for the record, Stephen with a V, Cohen as in the Assemblywoman. The nature of my opposition is spending the money on translation versus training uh, specific to the population of students with disabilities love love the due process piece from a policy perspective i just can't get there in terms of prioritization and with that madam chair thank you and i yield broadcast services is there anyone else in opposition chair the testimony line is open and working however we have no more callers in opposition to ab 194. Thank oh you. pardon me we had just one other person join in there Okay, thank you. Just a moment. And chair. Opposition, please. All right. Caller with the last three digits, 653. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Hello, my name is Dora Martinez, D O R A M A R T I N E Z. I am here representing the Nevada Disability Peer Action Coalition, and I just want to echo uh, what the prior um, caller said. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is there anyone else in opposition? 
Chair, the testimony line is open and working. However, we have no more callers in opposition to AB 194. Thank you. And uh, those in neutral, please. To testify in neutral on AB 194, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 653, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Chair, there is no one to testify in neutral on AB 194 at this time. Thank you very much. I'm going to invite Ms. Torres back up. Uh, any closing statement, Ms. Torres? Uh, uh, Chair, I believe that there's somebody on the Zoom to testify in support, uh, Ms. Bailey Bordelin from Legal Aid. Thank you very much. We miss Zoom. So, Ms. Bordelin, please, we'll go back to support. I apologize. Thank you, and apologies for where I am, uh, Bailey Bordelin, for the record, with the Nevada Coalition of Legal Service Providers. We just want to thank the Assemblywoman for bringing this bill and working with us on it and emphasize the importance that we see in this bill and would hope to see it um, move out of ways and means with the support of this committee because it does have some really critical pieces for our kids, as Assemblywoman Peters pointed out, that uh, are struggling right now. And what we think is critical in this bill is that as children do uh, transition and get in trouble at school due to the various issues and reasons behind that, um, this bill will ensure that they continue to receive as much education as possible and that they're not out of the classroom and missing that instruction when they've already missed so much instruction this year. So uh, for that reason, we encourage you to support this bill as well and hope to continue working on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh any other closing remarks, Ms. Torres? Thank you, Assemblyman Torres, for the record. You know, I just want to stress the importance of this piece of legislation. Currently, we have several counties that have no appeals process for suspensions and expulsions, and it is a requirement for federal law. Um, so to make sure that, you know, the state of Nevada is upholding the rights of Nevada students and providing due process, it is imperative that we pass AB 194. Thank you. I urge your support. Thank you very much, Ms. Torres. So with that, we'll go ahead and close the hearing on Assembly Bill 194. And we will go ahead and open the hearing on Assembly Bill 231. I'll invite uh, Chair Cohen up. Please just give us an overview and then we'll go from there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Leslie Cohen, Assembly District 29. Uh, what Assembly Bill 231 does is that it um, requires the State Board of Education to create a subcommittee to review and make recommendations on age-appropriate and historically accurate instruction about the Holocaust and other genocides, uh, including but not limited to Armenian, Cambodian, Darfurian, Guatemalan, and Rwandan. Um, as part of that, for instance, there will be uh, inventory done of the available classroom materials for educators and uh, a review of professional development and if it will be you know, where it will be necessary. Um, that the board will then report its finding and any recommendations, including the subcommittee's recommendations to the Legislative Committee on Education and that'll happen in even years. And then in, um, in odd years, the Legislative Committee on Education will consider the report and provide its own recommendations to the legislature uh, with any recommendations to ensure the instruction required in the bill is included in the curricula for relevant courses. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Kaufman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, according to the Nevada Department of Education, as amended, the bill would still cost the department approximately $4,000 over the biennium to provide technical support to the subcommittee. And I believe we would want to clarify that the subcommittee will, uh, that within that, that that's purely technical support dollars, that the subcommittee will not be compensated. Is that correct? Ms. Cohen? Uh, Leslie Cohen, Assembly District 29. Yes, according to the Department of Education, um, it's, it's staff hours. Okay. All right. 
Thank you very much. Just want to make sure we create the appropriate record. Um, we have someone from the Department of Education. If you'd like to go ahead and introduce yourself and just give us a brief overview of your fiscal note. Thank you, Chair Carlton. This is Sarah Nick, Nevada Department of Education. For the record, I want to thank Assemblywoman Cohen for working with us. We were able to reduce the fiscal note um, from the fiscal note um, paired with the bill as introduced. And as the Assemblywoman correctly noted, uh, the fiscal note is reflective for staff time. The content and intent of 8231 is very important to the department. And we want to be able to come back in the 2023 session with a very successful implementation of this bill. And in order to do that, um, staff would need to be compensated for carrying out the duties of the subcommittee and various and various reporting requirements as well. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm seeing that the it's approximately four thousand dollars over the biennium. So you just touch the threshold just enough to bring it into ways and means a couple of bucks less and it would have kept moving. So, all right. So you're right on the edge there. Uh, Ms. Cohen, did you have anyone else you'd like to uh, present? No. Thank you very much you. with that. Committee members, are there any questions of Ms. Cohen at this time? Thank you. So thank you very much. We'll go ahead and open it up. This is the hearing for Assembly Bill 231. So we will go to those in support. If I could have those here in the room in support, go ahead and come forward. Uh, thank you, Chair Carlton. Elliot Mallon for the record, representing the Anti-Defamation League. Just want to put us on the record as in support and uh, really appreciate uh, Chair Cohen for bringing this forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mallon. Appreciate the brevity. It's always helpful in these evening meetings. Do we have anyone on Zoom that wish to testify in support on Assembly Bill 231? I don't believe so. Broadcast services, could you go to the phone lines? Is there anyone in support of Assembly Bill 231? To testify in support of AB 231, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 577, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Hi, this is Chris Daly, DAOI, Nevada State Education Association, the voice of Nevada educators for over 120 years. Uh, we supported uh, AB 231 uh, on the policy over in the Senate Education Committee, but uh, the fiscal note here we think is the minimus and the importance uh, of uh, education on the Holocaust and, and the other genocides uh, is so significant that uh, we think, uh, you know, this is a de minimis fiscal note and the committee should approve it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, moving on to anyone else in support broadcast services, please. For those of you that just joined the call, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue to testify in support of AB 231. Chair, the testimony line is open and working. However, we have no more callers in support of AB 231. Anyone in opposition, please. To testify in opposition on AB 231, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 653, Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Hi, I'm Shirley Cyrus. It's S-H-I-R-L-E-Y-C-Y-R-U-S. -E and I wanna talk in support of this bill. Um, I think it's very important to learn about the history of not only America, but the world, because I'm in eighth grade and I attend the Washer County School District Public Schools. And we've never really learned about this, but I'm really interested in it. And I kind of have to learn about it like on my own. But I also think my classmates and my peers would also enjoy to learn about this as well. And we would also benefit from this. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Thank you. And you were in support. So thank you. So with that broadcast services, do we have anyone who is in opposition? Uh, 
Chair, there are no callers in opposition to AB 231 at this time. Thank you. Anyone in neutral, please. To testify in neutral on AB 231, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, the testimony line is open and working. However, we have no callers in neutral on AB 231. Thank you very much. So, Ms. Cohen, did you have any closing comments on AB 231? No? She knows how to read the room. She's good. Okay. So, with that, we'll close the hearing on Assembly Bill 231. And, committee members, we will open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 278. And we will invite Ms. Duran to the testimony table. Good evening, Madam Chair and committee. My name is B. Duran, uh, representing uh, District uh, Assembly District 11 in Las Vegas. Um, my bill is AB 278. It requires a physician to complete a request for certain data when renewing his or her license with the Board of Medical Examiners and the State Board of Osteopathic Medicine. The Department of Health and Human Services must develop the data request. The confidential information obtained by the licensing board must be sent to the department, which will collect and maintain it. AB, AB, as well, AB 278 is an initial effort to monitor health care consolidation and protect competition between health care facilities. Uh, there was um, a fiscal note submitted on March 31st, 2021 by the Department of Health and Human Services, Public and Behavioral Health. And after the amendment, they uh, decided to that it can be removed because they can uh, identify the use of existing staff to meet the annual reporting requirement that they no longer need the fiscal note. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. We'll turn it over to Ms. Kaufman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, that is correct. There was an unsolicited fiscal note that uh, basically indicated that the fiscal impact to the amended uh, bill related to AB 278 uh, no longer has a fiscal impact. Okay. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Mr. Rand, committee members, with the fiscal note being noticed that it has been removed, does anyone have any questions for Assemblywoman Duran at this time? Not seeing any. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to Ways and Means. I think this was your first time. So good job. It is. It is the first time and first time um, presenting. So thank you very much. A little nervous. That's <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you. So with that, this is the hearing for Assembly Bill 278. So we'll go ahead and continue the hearing. Do we have anyone, broadcast services, do we have anyone listed or in the queue for support on Assembly Bill 278? Anyone wishing to testify in support of AB 278, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, the testimony line is open and working. However, we have no one to testify in support of AB 278. Thank you very much. Do we have anyone in opposition, please? To testify in opposition to AB 278, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, the testimony line is open and working, but we have no callers to testify in opposition to AB 278. Thank you very much. Do we have anyone in neutral? To testify in neutral on AB 278, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 860, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good evening. My name is Erin Williams. It's spelled C-R-I-N-W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S. 
I'm here representing the Division of Public and Behavioral Health, and as indicated, we have removed our fiscal note based upon the amendment. Um, the division has determined that the fiscal impact submitted previously to develop a red cap solution is no longer needed. Instead, the division is able to develop a survey using an existing system to meet the requirements of this bill. Additionally, the division has identified the use of existing staff to meet the annual reporting requirements. Therefore, the fiscal impact for this bill can be removed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Broadcast services, do we have anyone else in neutral? Chair, the testimony line is open and working. However, we have no more callers to testify neutrally on AB 278. All right, thank you very much. So with that, Mr. Ann, did you have any closing comments? Thank you, madam. Um, I'm not sure if we had somebody on Zoom that was going to test. Oh, let me go to Zoom then. I, I, I always forget about the Zoom option. So do we have anyone on Zoom wishing to give testimony on Assembly Bill 278? Ms. Holmes? Hi, um, yes, this is uh, Maya Holmes from the Culinary Health Fund. Um, I was here to ask, answer questions, um, but I also just wanted to let um, the committee know that we, the Culinary Health Fund, is in support of AB 278. Thank you very much, Ms. Holmes, and I apologize for not getting to you sooner. Thank you. So with that, committee members not seeing anything else, thank you very much, Ms. Duran. So with that, we will go ahead and close the hearing on Assembly Bill 278. We will skip Assembly Bill 348 because I will be presenting on that one. And we will go to Assembly Bill 356. We'll invite Mr. Watts to the testimony table. Then we'll go back around to the other bills that are being um, presented by members. So Mr. Watts, if you would go ahead and proceed. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Howard Watts representing Assembly District 15. Assembly Bill 356 in its first reprint uh, does two things. First, uh, it uh, requires that after January 1st, 2027, that the waters of the Colorado River, which are distributed by the Southern Nevada Water Authority, may not be used to irrigate non-functional turf on any property that is not zoned exclusively for a single family residence. Additionally, it tasks the Interim Committee on Public Lands to conduct, uh, as part of its normal course of business, a study on matters of water conservation during the next interim. Uh, with that, I know uh, there were fiscal notes submitted by the Division of Water Resources. The bill as amended no longer applies to the division. We do have uh, a representative from the Southern Nevada Water Authority available by Zoom to answer any questions that you have about uh, the impact to their agency, and I can speak to uh, the intention with relation to the Interim Public Lands Committee. Thank you, Mr. Watts. We'll go to Ms. Kaufman, and then we'll have a couple questions for you, Ms. Ms. Kaufman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, uh, this uh, bill uh, does contain an interim study, and the uh, Legislative Council Bureau testified at their hearing that they do not have uh, funds for interim studies, and they're, they're um, budget so any additional interim studies would be considered um, as, as additional expenses to their to their budget thank you very much Ms. Kaufman Mr. Watts would you clarify the record on the study please yes thank you Howard Watts for the record and uh, in, in case any uh, clarification needs to be made the intent is that uh, this investigation would take place uh, within the interim committee on public lands as part of their normal course of business. So it would be essentially an issue that would be looked into during the normal meeting schedule of that committee and would not require uh, any additional meetings or workload to accomplish uh, what's intended uh, under the language of the bill. So with, with that, Mr. Watts, by using the term study, I believe is what's throwing us a curve do you think it would be better if a, a letter of intent was just issued on guidance to the 
public lands committee to make sure it's absolutely clear that there are no dollars associated with getting this work done that it would be done within their current budget allotment thank you howard watts for the record yes i'm amenable to any solution that that clarifies that uh because that is the intent okay good we just want to make sure everybody's on the same page we appreciate that committee members do you have any questions of mr watts on this particular item miss benitez thompson thank you so much and i think that to your point madam chairwoman that you po pointed out is that i think a lot of times we've been using the word study when what we really mean is we want a board to deliberate and discuss a specific matter and so perhaps we could probably get into the better habit myself included of saying um, making that distinction of you know the study will trigger will trigger a big process and if you're looking for an interim committee to have a conversation then you know we're looking for them to deliberate and discuss and agendize the the item um, versus study it and so I appreciate the fact that you made that distinction and that that maybe that'll help some of some other conversations that are going on where people are like why did my study get pulled into it I just want the board to discuss it then then we can we can flush that out Thank you. Uh, does anyone else have any questions of Assemblyman Watts at this time? Hearing none, did you have anyone else that you'd like to have thank present at this moment? Thank you, Madam Chair. Howard Watts, for the record. We do have Chan Chauncey Chowdung with Southern Nevada Water Authority if members have any questions uh, for the Water Authority. Okay. I hate to open this up, but I will ask. Um, any questions from any members of the committee at this time? Ms. Peters. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just think I w we should get on the record whether um, this action would result in any kind of rate increase or cost to consumers who are um, a part of your, your jurisdiction. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, Chauncey Chowdhury on behalf of the Southern Nevada uh, Water Authority. Madam Chair, through you to the Assemblywoman, um, I do not know if you can see me or hear me. Uh, on my screen, everybody's blank. Um, so can We can see you me? and we can hear you, so just pretend we're there. Okay, sounds good. Uh, yes, there is no anticipation of any rate increase under this provision. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Peters. Ms. Peters, thank you. Mr. Shadong, any other questions at this time? Not seeing any other questions. Thank you very much. So with that, this is the hearing on Assembly Bill 348. Getting a strange feedback noise of some type. So with that, I'll go to broadcast services. Do we have anyone in support for Assembly Bill 358? Mr. To testify in support of oh, AV 358. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, David Daslich, Director of Government Affairs with the Vegas Chamber, just here to uh, encourage our support. We believe this is an important uh, measure for conservation, especially given the current water situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Daslich. Sorry for the confusion. Broadcast services, if we would now go to the phone lines for those in support. To testify in support of AB 356, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, one, five, five, please press star six to unmute. You will have, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Christy Cabrera, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-C-A-B-R-E-R-A. -R -R I'm the Policy and Advocacy Director of the Nevada Conservation League here in support of AB 356. As the driest state in the nation, our uh, state's water resources are precious and should not be wasted. Um, water conservation is huge, and this bill will save literally billions of gallons of water every year. So we urge the committee's support. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in support, please? Call with the last three digits, 662. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. My name is Kyle Rohring, K-Y-L-E-R-O-E-R-I-N-K. 
I'm the executive director of the Great Basin Water Network. Chair Carlton and members of the committee of the Great Basin Water Network supports this bill, and for good reason. Our Colorado River allocation is set to take a number of cuts, likely to take them in the uh, coming years, and to put things into perspective, the amount of water that the SNWA will save thanks to AB 356 is tantamount to um, those cuts that we're going to take in the coming years. And I've heard some folks say that this is a negligible amount of water, but I cannot stress enough that no drop of, of water on the Colorado River is, is too small. The amount of water that AB 356 will save is um, can amount to the amount of water Lake Mead lost to evaporation in the month of March. It's also the amount that can serve tens of thousands of residents in southern Nevada, especially if those residents are water smart. This bill won't cost the state a cent, but doing nothing could be costly. Uh, AB 356 demonstrates that Nevada is setting the example on the Colorado River. This is truly a watershed opportunity. I want to thank Assemblyman Watts, along with Mr. Ensminger, Mr. Chowdong, and Mr. Belanger for their work on this. Please support this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else in support on the phone, please? Chair, the testimony line is open and working. However, we have no one left to testify in support of AB 356. Thank you. Anyone in opposition, please, on the phone line? To testify in opposition to AB 356, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, the testimony line is open and working. However, there is no one to testify in opposition to AB 356. And if we could go to those in neutral, please. To testify in neutral on AB 356, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, the testimony line is open and working. However, we have no one left to testify neutrally on AB 356. Thank you very much, Mr. Watts. Any closing comments? He's going to pass. He can read the room well. So with that, we will go ahead and close the hearing on Assembly Bill 356. We will go back to the top of the batting order that has our committee members involved. So with that, I will open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 149. We'll invite Ms. Peters to the presentation table. And thank you, committee members, for your courtesy in letting the other folks go first. We do appreciate that. So Ms. Peters. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for hearing AB 149 today related to Cannabis Industry Laboratory data, public transparency, and reporting. The purpose of AB 149 is to increase transparency for consumers of the cannabis products in Nevada. The Cannabis Compliance Board has the authority to develop and publish data collected via the seed to sale program known as METRIC. Laboratory data is one of the most important subsets of data available through the METRICS program. Laboratory data tells us the level of THC in each batch of tested product, as well as any potential contaminants, such as mold or toxins, and is used to ensure consumer safety. Section 1 of AB 149 proposes a database be developed that contains all laboratory information related to cannabis products sold in the state of Nevada. The amendment revised this section to ensure that database of laboratory data is available to the public in a readily accessible format and requires that a biannual report be submitted to the legislature describing the laboratory data and any pertinent analysis that was conducted on the data and how it was used by the Cannabis Compliance Board or the public. This is why we're here today. The Cannabis Compliance Board has determined that the development of the database system that would meet these requirements under bill, the bill language would cost $178,800 in fiscal year 2020, sorry, 2022, and $63,200 in fiscal year 2023. I believe there are re representatives on the line who can speak in greater detail on the fiscal note. Thank you very much, Ms. Peters. We'll go to Ms. Kaufman next. Uh, 
Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Sarah Kaufman, LCB Fiscal. That is correct. The Cannabis con uh, Compliance Board submitted a fiscal note of $178,800 in fiscal year 2022 and $63,200 in fiscal year 2023. The fiscal note relates to Section 3 of the bill, which requires the Board to implement and maintain an electronic database containing information related to testing conducted on cannabis products by independent testing laboratories. The bill also provides that this information be accessible to licensees. Okay, thank you. And so this would, these would be general fund dollars. These are not dollars that could be used through reserves through the Cannabis Compliance Board? Uh, Madam Chair, the Cannabis Compliance Board is uh, funded through the marijuana uh, retail tax. Uh, however, any funds uh, that are uh, not utilized by the Cannabis Compliance Board then get transferred to the, uh, the currently the DSA, which will um, be the Pupil Center Funding uh, Plan or the um, Education Fund um, going forward into next biennium. But it is my understanding that these dollars can be used for this. It would just have an impact on the downstream effect. There's a percentage that goes to law enforcement, and then there's a percentage that goes to uh, whatever funding formula evolves for uh, uh, K through 12 funding. Is that correct? Madam Chair, that is correct. Okay. So it wouldn't necessarily have to come out of the K-12 funding portion of it. It could come out of the law enforcement funding of it. It would just have an impact downstream. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I believe the $5 million that is for the, um, the law uh, is in statute, but I would have to double check on that one. Okay. I think we would have something we would need to investigate there, but I just want to make sure folks realize um, that this is, doesn't necessarily have to be general fund, that there are other dollars that could possibly be available. So with that, do we have questions of Ms. Peters at this time? Uh, Ms. Benitez Thompson. Thank you so much. I guess in the conversations that you've had around this, because the transparency piece is good, but I guess with, in, the labs are collecting this data. They're, they're getting better at collecting it. And we know now from the testimony we had from the Cannabis Compliance Board that there were issues um, coming that we learned from an audit last session about individual the amount of data that was being put into the seed to sale system but it seems like we've resolved that now so i guess i'm wondering the 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 data from the labs exist doesn't necessarily have to be the the onus of the cannabis compliance boards for what that data has like i'm trying to think is there another uh, does you know i guess what has been the conversation with the lab's involvement on this and the data they have and transparency in it? I imagine you might tell me, is it proprietary or? No, not at all. Um, some Assemblywoman Peters, for the record. Um, the, the database build out is really the front end um, for user access to the data. Right now, you can pull data from the metric program, but it is messy and it doesn't tell you a lot and it's not aggregated in any specific way. So it's not super useful if you're trying to look at trends or if you're trying to assess who has the most consistent THC in their product or whatever it is that you may be looking at. What the Cannabis Compliance Board is proposing under this particular budget item, right, this budget cost, is to develop out a user-friendly front end that takes that metric data, translates it into something that's usable by the user of the data, and then, uh, and exportable so that they can use, any person in the state can use that data for their own edification or for complaints or for other issues. So to dashboard it. Yes. Yeah, okay. And so I think the, the fiscal note is, as I'm reading it, I think a piece of the fiscal note looks like that language has been amended out. So this, this f fiscal note then is basically, and I guess the department could tell us, this is the cost of upgrading the software to create the dashboard. This is like a tech piece then, right? I see the effect on future biennium, but I would think if it's a one-time upgrade to be able to take your data and turn it into a dashboard, and maybe that's my question for the the cannabis board. I guess I don't know why it would continue to cost more money down the road. And there's Mr. Kilmus. Thank you. 
And I, and I would ap appreciate the, the response from the Cannabis Compliance Board, but I would also like um, to, to say that um, this is not bid out. It hasn't been bid out. So this would be a not to exceed cost estimate related to the expectation of what is to what we could develop out for uh, with with known um, players who are already contracted with the Cannabis Compliance Board. So just depending on what it is that they end up bidding out um, that could change this cost in the current build out and then a future biennium. And thank you, Ms. Peters. I'll go to Mr. Klimas. Thank you, Madam Chair, Tyler Klimas for the record, and thank you for the uh, the question. And to, to answer the question, yes, so this, this money would be for a dashboard to create a dashboard that does not exist now. Thank you. Any other questions of Mr. Klimas at this time? Ms. Benitez Thompson, yes. Thank you. So just for the, the quick follow-up then, so the, and if Ms. Kaufman said it, and I, it literally just fell out of my head, I apologize. But so the piece of the fiscal note that I'm still looking at, is that then just $63,000 then? But that, that's just the software piece and it would probably be a one-time versus an ongoing? Thank you for the question, Tyler Klimas, again, for the record. And so there's an initial build-out fee and then the ongoing cost, not only for data storage, given the massive amounts of data that we would need to store on this dashboard and the continued maintenance. And so that's what the continued cost of the 63,200 that you see in, in future fiscal years. The, the larger chunk is the original build-out of the dashboard. Any follow-up? Not seeing any follow-up. So the original fiscal note of 178,800 is for the build-out and the 63,200 is for the ongoing, correct? Tyler Klimas for the record, Chair, yes, that's correct. I just wanted to make sure we had a correct record. Okay, so with that, any other questions from Ms. Benitez Thompson? Did I, you have I another follow-up? I could ask a fairly unpopular question, but I guess we could say if we've stood marijuana up with the model that it is essentially a program that pays for itself, right? Um, so I, I guess have we have we asked labs if if they could be a piece of the solution for for this or I imagine that they would say no one would willingly say yes, but I guess I I, th I think it's fair to ask just because that's the way we've stood it up with throughout the marijuana industry is it's kind of a, it's a little enterprise fund. It pays for itself. Sarah Peters, for the record, I, I, I also wanted to point out and to kind of your point of how can this create cost savings or how can we absorb this into the Cannabis Compliance Board? One of the issues with the current way the metric system produces data is that it, co it creates a lot of staff time sifting through that data and pulling the data out to do the trend analysis to see if there are problems, to then pursue those problems with the bad actors, which puts them out on how many audits they can do every year and how many bad actors they can, they can follow up on every year. To do create this data, this dashboard, also would create an, uh, a more um, quick what's a better word for this, a quicker way for them to access that trend analysis and those data that would help them to pursue these bad actors and do their job in a more efficient way. Uh, Mr. Klimas, did you have any follow-up on that? Uh, Madam Chair, I did not. Okay. So with that, um, the idea of being able to actually track down bad actors quicker, I believe is something that I had not read into this software proposal. I, usually your brain just goes to getting the data and, and, and putting it out there, but the, the suggestion that this would make it easier for, uh, for the C Cannabis Compliance Board and those that work with it to get a better snapshot in a quicker amount of time on who those bad actors might be, I believe is something that's an important conversation around 
just the security that's involved with this. So thank you, Ms. Peters, for, for pointing that out. I had not thought to look at it from quite that direction before. So with that, committee members, are there any other questions for Ms. Peters at this time? Ms. Gorlow. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just had a quick question with other states um, legalizing marijuana. Do any other states have a dashboard similar to what you're proposing that we could kind of borrow their template and, and use for the build out? Thank you, Assemblywoman Peters, for the record. I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I would d d um, ask the CCB to maybe respond if they know. Sure, thank you, uh, Tyler Climas, for the record, and thanks for the questions. Yes, so other jurisdictions, other regulatory agencies do utilize dashboards. They're all a little bit different. For an example, um, Oregon and Massachusetts both have an ongoing uh, contract with a, a data service, uh, both in the neighborhood of, of six figures um, to provide data, not only for labs, but in, in all aspects of the industry. Um, so it is something that is utilized uh, uh, a little bit differently uh, in different jurisdictions. Any other questions at this time from other, other committee members? Not seeing anyone else wishing to be recognized. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Klimas, Ms. Peters. So with that, we this is the uh, hearing on Assembly Bill 149. We will go ahead and open it up for those in support. If I could go to those in support on the phone lines, please. To testify in support on AB 149, Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, two, four, seven, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Hello, this is Will Adler, W-I-L-L-A-D-L-E-R, representing scientists for consumer safety. Scientists for Consumer Safety is the one of the origins of this bill. We are a group of uh, lab testers in the state of Nevada who have been testing cannabis from the, the early medical days of the early medical marijuana testing, when the first lab regulations are sort of being developed. But as this program has developed and as it's grown, uh, we are now on the metric seed to cell tracking software and that data stream. So to be clear, this data is already collected. This data is already taken in. So we already have to process this data. We already produce this data in real time already. This data is already just put into a data bank that only we can see. And only the data we can see is, is the data that we personally have produced in the metric data bank. Uh, the ideal of this would be to just publish that metric data in a public data bank. Now, we don't really have to manipulate or do much more than that, but just take that metric data and put it on a public data bank. Whatever form that happens in would be a, a, a boon to transparency in the state of Nevada. That's the one message you want to get across is the more transparency, the better. Labs can then call out cheaters who are using the lab process to cheat and manipulate lab test scores or going from lab to lab shopping to find the best score. The public could then call out bad tested products if they could simply look up the test score and see, hey, did I happen to get a test score that was good or did I happen to get a bad one because it's matching the moldy product I'm looking at here? Just some sort of way that you could double check the system that's already being done sort of behind the scenes. So we look for uh, any support we can get on AB 149 and the, the transparency it looks to bring forth. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else in support of Assembly Bill 149? Chair, there are no more callers in support on AB 149. Is there anyone in opposition? To testify in opposition to AB 149, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition to AB 149 at this time. Thank you very much. Do we have anyone in neutral? To testify in neutral on AB 149, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers at this time to testify in neutral on AB 149. Thank you very much. Ms. Peters, did you have any closing comments? Thank you, Madam Chair. I did want to point out that Mr. Adler is correct that we could give the public access to the metric data as it comes out of metric. 
which isn't easy to use, and you would have to figure out a way to manipulate it yourself. But that would increase the transparency that, um, with the laboratory data that we're looking for from this bill. The dashboard is really an extension of that to make it more user friendly and more mm, uh, and easier to manipulate the data and see what's going on in those pictures. Thank you, Ms. Peters. So with that, we'll go ahead and close the hearing on Assembly Bill 149. And we will open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 167 and we'll invite Mr. Levitt to the testimony table. Good evening, please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair and fellow members of Ways and Means Committee. For the record, I'm Glenn Levitt. Um, in short, this bill requires public and charter K through 12 schools as well as NC universities to print tel the telephone number and text message option for the National Suicide Prevention Hotline or its successor organization on any newly printed or reprinted student identification cards. Um, as far as the fiscal impact goes, at this time, uh, the, fiscal, the fiscal note that was submitted um, has been pulled, um, as far as I was aware. Um, it was pulled due to the amendment. First, the amendment was clarifying that schools that uh, do not currently have student IDs are not required to start printing student IDs. And second, the second part of the amendment was to remove the requirement for um, information to be printed on the back of ID cards. Um, this amendment came out of uh, the fiscal notes submitted by CSN, uh, understanding that they have a system that's a little bit antiquated and it, uh, in, it's the only institution in the state that cannot print on the back of their IDs. Um, and so we amended the bill so that they could print on the front of the IDs until their system is updated. And that is all I have. Thank you, Mr. Levitt. We'll go to Ms. Kaufman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the bill, as, uh, as originally introduced, did have a fiscal impact from the Nevada System of Higher Education of $843,383 in 2022 and $10,263 in fiscal year 2023 related to the replacement of all IDs um, to be uh, having the, the information printed on the back of those IDs. Um, as amended, the uh, Nevada System of Higher Education provided us with a revised estimate um, that would be $26,263 in fiscal year 2022. However, uh, we just received uh, an email prior to the start of this, um, uh, this meeting from the Nevada System of Higher Education indicating that uh, there is no more fiscal impact. Thank you very much, Ms. Kaufman. And if you would make sure we can make that email part of the record, that would be great. So, uh, Mr. Levitt, you went from 843,000 and change, um, really not 853, down to 26, and now to zero. So you could write a book on this. You might need to give lessons. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. So with that, and she has removed their fiscal note. Apparently, they have figured out that this is something that they can do without any uh, undue fiscal impact. So that being part of the record right now, uh, committee members, does anyone have any questions for Mr. Levitt at this time? Not seeing any. Okay. So with that, it is the hearing on Assembly Bill 167. We'll go ahead and open it up. Do we have anyone uh, broadcast services on the phone in support of Assembly Bill 167? To testify in support of AB 167, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 520, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Caller 250, please press star 6 to unmute. Uh, Chair Carlton and members of the committee, Anthony Ruiz, A-N-T-H-O-N-Y, 
R-U-I-Z, when Nevada State College. Nevada State College is in full support of AB 167 as amended. For Nevada State College, there, there will be no fiscal impact to add the additional information required by the bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. I believe we do have someone on Zoom. So if we could uh, queue up, I believe, the system. And she is on Zoom. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Julia Tesco with the Nevada System of Higher Education. Um, we are in support of the bill, and I am confirming that we have been able to, um, uh, in clarifying some of the points in the bill, we have been able to remove all of the fiscal impact. Thank you very much, Ms. Tesco. We appreciate you putting that on the record and being with us this evening. So broadcast services, I'll go back to you. Is there anyone else in support of the bill on the phone line, please? Caller with the last three digits, 859. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Caller, you are unmuted on our end. Is your phone muted? Yes, it was. My apology. Uh, for the record, my phone or my name is Lauren, L A U R E N. And my last name is Porter, P-O-R-T-E-R. -E Madam Chair, I would first like to thank you for the opportunity to speak on this bill. I am a student at Nevada State College, and I would like to speak in support of AB 167. Nevada State has taken the step of, of putting the suicide prevention lifeline on the back of all newly printed faculty and staff cards, um, and it was an easy change. So I would like to submit my support for AB 167. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other callers in support, please? Call it with the last three digits, 232. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Hello, and thank you, Committee Chairwoman Carlton and committee members. My name is Brenda Pearson, B-R-E-N-D-A-P-E-A-R-S-O-N, and I am here representing the Clark County Education Association. CCEA is in support of AB 167, and we ask this to be the version enacted. Though there is a similar clause in Senate Bill 249, CCEA favors the prescriptive nature of Assembly Bill 167 in which the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline or its successor organization is specified. The COVID pandemic has exacerbated the health, mental health crisis our students face every day. It is about time that we as Nevadans stand together and give our students the resources they need should they require crisis support in times of suicidal ideation by ensuring that information to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is readily accessible on the back of every student ID, students will be given one more resource that will help promote the destigmatization of mental illness and stim stimulate discussion of the subject matter. One of the most crucial clauses of this bill is the availability of information for texting. Many of our students that are connected in the digital age are more comfortable with, with texting than phone calls. If the difference between saving a child's life is a text or a phone call, then why not make sure that there's every option available? Lastly, regardless of the fiscal note, this is not an expense that we can be stingy on. This is an expense that would be wonderful to utilize COVID ESSER funds on until we can designate a revenue source to bring our education funding back to our early 2000 standards when we were in line with the nation. CCA respectfully asks this committee to help our educators by ensuring that every resource possible is available to our students. Thank you. Is there anyone else in support on the phone line? Chair, the testimony line is open and working, or we have no more callers in support of AB 167. Thank you very much. Is there anyone in opposition on the phone lines, please? To testify in opposition to AB 167, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers 
to testify in opposition to AB 167 at this time. Thank you. Is there anyone in neutral? Anyone wishing to testify in neutral on AB 167, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers to testify in neutral on AB 167. Thank you very much. We will close the hearing on AB 167, and I will hand over the real honest-to-goodness gavel, not the virtual one, to the vice chair so that I can present AB 348 to the committee. Good evening, committee. We will open the hearing on Assembly Bill 348 and we'll welcome Chair Carlton. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Vice Chair. For your record, Assemblywoman Maggie Carlton, Assembly District 14, here to present to you Assembly Bill 348. Assembly Bill 348 transfers the Patient Protection Commission from the Office of the Governor. Um, to the Director of Health and Human Services. This is a budget item. It is in conflict with the way the governor's budget is currently proposed, but there have been numerous discussions with the uh, department about whether it belongs in um, aging and disability services or in the director's office. This item will be closed in a subcommittee hearing in the very near future. So I would not expect this bill to move until that decision has been made. And once that decision is made, this could be considered a budget implementation bill. Uh, there are other provisions in the bill that address the makeup of the Patient Protection Commission, which are more policy oriented. Uh, I believe the way the bill is currently drafted, the fiscal notes and identified cost have been removed as amended but I would be happy to let staff confirm that and happy to stand for any questions, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Assemblywoman Carlton. We'll have Ms. Kaufman. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, for the record, Sarah Kaufman, Legislative Council Bureau. Yes, this uh, bill has been identified as a budget implementation bill. Uh, there have been uh, no actual fiscal impacts or, or dollars that have been identified uh, for this bill, however, um, it, it does implement a budget decision that is going to be considered uh, by the uh, Subcommittee on Human Services on Wednesday. Thank you so much for the explanation. Members, any questions? Assemblywoman Tulse. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. So if I tracked with that, that means that the, the current fiscal note of two point roughly 2.6 million in fiscal year 21-22 and 3.6 million in 22-23 is being removed. And so then what we will be considering on Wednesday will be a zero fiscal note for budget implementation. Uh, Madam, Madam Vice Chair, through you to Assemblywoman Tulls. Yes, that is correct. So the uh, Division of Health and Human Services uh, did provide a, a fiscal note. But as amended, uh, that fiscal note uh, or the impact on it was removed. Uh, the, the concern that fiscal had, uh, uh, staff had expressed on this was related to uh, rule number 14.6, which identifies uh, any bills that may be considered uh, budget implementation bills uh, should be targeted as uh, bills that are either exempt or eligible for exemption. And so that's why this bill was identified by fiscal staff. And if I may, Madam Vice Chair, when the bill was amended in Health and Human Services, the all-payer claims database, I stumble over that every time, and I've said it so many times, was, was amended out. I, there was a miscommunication with legal. The all-payer claims database is actually a proposal from the Patient Protection Commission, so it was encapsulated originally into AB 348. It was never intended to be, so it was amended out in the hearing, so therefore that fiscal note has been taken care of. Thank you. Thank you so much for that explanation. Members, any other questions? Seeing that. 
you have your chairman at the testimony table, folks. Come on. This doesn't happen often. No. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be happy to be excused. No. We do have one question from Assemblyman Roberts. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. And so just so that I'm, I'm clear, so we will take this up as a, as a budget item separate from, from the bill in normal budget closings. Maybe that's for Ms. Kaufman. Uh, Madam Vice Chair, through you to uh, Assemblyman Roberts. Yes, that is correct. So if, if the subcommittee and then uh, subsequently after that, the full committees choose to uh, move the Patient Protection Commission to the um, director's office, this would then become a budget implementation bill and that would have to be passed in order to effectuate the, the decisions that are being made uh, by uh, the recommendation of the subcommittee and then the full committees. It, it, just a quick follow-up. So we'll, we'll take no action on this bill here before us today, or will we? Will uh, we will do that and a budget? Madam Vice Chair, through you to uh, Assemblyman Roberts, so that, that would be up to um, Chair Carlton to right. determine uh, when, when she would like to move this bill. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your question. And, and thank you, staff, and thank you, Vice Chair. And it will be treated the same way as the other budget implementation bills. I believe once we make the decision in subcommittee and it goes towards the full committee, this bill will start making its way so that they can kind of move at the same time. We don't want to have one get too far ahead of the other. We want them to stay fairly close to each other as we move forward. That's typically how we would handle a budget implementation bill. Knowing that they are tied together, if one fails, the other fails, but they both do need to move along the same path fairly close. Thank you. Ways and Means 101. Seeing no other questions, then we will go to our Zoom and then the phone lines, unless you have something before we go to support. No, thank you, Madam Chair, very much. I will step away. Thank you. Awesome. Then we'll ask our broadcast staff, do we have anyone on Zoom who wishes to testify in support of Assembly Bill 348? Do we have anyone on Zoom or on the phone lines who wishes to testify in support of Assembly Bill 348? To testify in support on AB 348, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there's no one to testify in support of AB 348 at this time. Thank you so much. Do we have anyone in the queue who wishes to testify in opposition of Assembly Bill 348? To testify in opposition to three, four, Bill AB 348, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Vice Chair, there is no one to testify in opposition to AB 348. Thank you so much. Do we have anyone on Zoom or on the telephone lines who wish to testify in neutral? I think we see one on Zoom. Good evening. Uh, my name is Sandra Smith. I'm the Chief IT Manager for the Department of Health and Human Services, and I am here testifying in neutral to confirm that the fiscal note has been removed. Thank you so much for joining us tonight to give us that information. Do we have anyone else wishing to testify in the neutral? To testify in neutral on AB 348, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Vice Chair, the testimony line is open and working. However, there is no one to testify in neutral on AB 348. Thank you so much. Chair Carlton, do you have anything else to say? Okay. With that, we will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 348, and I will hand the gavel back over to Cheryl Kaufman. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Vice Chair. So with that, committee members, we have heard the bills that uh, were on our agenda for this evening. It's the chair's intent to go ahead and move some of the bills since we will not be having another meeting 
this week and we don't want to slow down the process i have been given permission from the speaker um, to move bills as we deem appropriate when necessary so and thank you mr speaker for being so gracious and giving me that opportunity through the rest of the session to keep bills moving so we don't slow down the process or get a little bit of a log jam so committee members i'll go through the bills that i have an intent on moving this evening and others we'll get some more information on and we'll deal with at the appropriate time. So it would be the chair's intent to move Assembly Bill 61, Assembly Bill 167, Assembly Bill, two sets of notes want to make sure I get them all correct assembly bill 61 assembly bill 167 assembly bill 194 assembly bill 231 assembly bill 279 278 oh I'm sorry I've got to stop writing over the top of that last number and then Assembly Bill 356. So committee members, those are the bills that I plan on processing right now. So with that, I can have Ms. Kaufman walk us through each bill. We'll make sure we make the appropriate motion and notation on how the bill will be handled moving forward. So Ms. Kaufman, if you would begin with Assembly Bill One, uh, Assembly Bill Sixty One, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Assembly Bill Sixty One, as amended, primarily revises provisions relating to trade practices. However, it also transferred authority from the Registration and Regulation of Credit Service Organizations from the Division of Mortgage Lending to the Department or to the uh, Consumer Affairs Division. Uh, Mr. Uh, Kruger from the Bureau of Consumer Protection testified that he um, uh, suggested a conceptual amendment to eliminate sections 17.3 through 17.9, which would uh, eliminate the fiscal impact by eliminating the provision that would uh, provide that uh, transfer of authority from uh, the Mortgage Lending Division to the Consumer uh, affairs division related to um, the credit service organizations. Uh, there was uh, no, no individuals that uh, testified in support, opposition, or neutral for this bill. Okay, thank you, Ms. Kaufman. So with those uh, three sections being removed, there will be no fiscal note. So it would be the chair's intent to accept a motion since this is a first reprint. Mm -hmm as an amend and do pass as amended that one always throws me just a little bit of a curve so because it's already been amended it is an amend and do pass as amended i would accept a motion from miss benitas thompson a second from miss monroe moreno any questions or comments on the motion <coughs> seeing none a, a comment mr levitt i just had a question so um, seeing, seeing that most of these fiscal notes were removed, or is that what we're voting on? Yes, you're just, well, you're, you're in, in essence, yes. Our jurisdiction covers the fiscal note. Uh -huh. It's not necessarily a policy vote. The bill came out of the policy committee. After we clear the fiscal note, we're going to send it back to the floor, and that's where the final passage so we on, can disagree on the bill with, would be. So we can disagree with the policy and be okay with the fact that it doesn't have a fiscal note out of this committee if you sure you would if you would like to and then if you're going to vote no on it on the floor if you would just let me know that would be fine but if you're just in opposition in general it's fine to be in opposition also but our job is to address and or clear and have full conversation about the fiscal notes Got it. thank you so much you're welcome so with that committee members all those in favor please signify by saying aye Aye. And those in opposition? No. I have Dr. Titus in opposition. 
And the bill carries, and I will ask Ms. Howdigy to handle the floor statement on this one. Okay, so with that, thank you, committee. Moving on to Assembly Bill 167. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Assembly Bill 167, as amended, requires the Board of Trustees of a school district, the governing body of a charter school, a university, a state college, and a community college to include certain information on identification cards issued to uh, pupils, uh, pupils or students as applicable. Uh, there was originally a fiscal note uh, that was provided by the Nevada System of Higher Education. However, um, several individuals from uh, the Nevada System of Higher Education um, uh, testified that the uh, amendment removed the fiscal impact. And there were uh, four individuals that were in support of this bill and it was uh, presented by Assemblyman Levitt. Thank you very much. So with that, committee members, the fiscal note has been removed on Assembly Bill 167. Are there any other questions or comments at this time? Seeing none, I would accept a motion to do pass Assembly, wait a minute, hold on. Just double checking my motions. So I would accept a motion, uh, a motion to do pass as amended AB 167. I have a motion from Ms. Bedinas Thompson, a uh, second from Ms. Monroe Moreno. Any questions or comments on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any in opposition? Hearing no opposition, passes unanimously at the members present. Mr. Levitt, we'll hand this one back to you since you're listed first on it. So you'll take care of the floor statement, please. Ms. Kaufman, moving on to the next bill, Assembly Bill 164. Uh, right? Yeah, there we go. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, AB 194, as amended, revises provisions governing the suspension and expulsion of pupils and provides in Section 7 the bill um, of the bill that the Department of Education, to the extent practicable, shall provide guidance to the Board of Trustees of each school district on uh, the appeal policy adopted by the Board of Trustees of such school districts pursuant to Section 5 of this Act in as many languages as possible for the benefit of the pupils and parents of legal guardians for principal, uh, for the pupil, excuse me. Uh, the uh, individual who, who presented on this bill was Assemblywoman Torres. Uh, the Department of Education provided a fiscal note of $31,214 in fiscal year 2022 and $578 in fiscal year 2023, which primarily um, was for translation services. Uh, there was some discussion related to um, the, the requirement of this as, as the bill does provide that this is for, to the extent practicable, uh, these um, translation services um, can be provided. And there was also further discussion uh, related to the, the usage of uh, federal funds uh, to cover these expenditures. Thank you very much, committee members. We did have a conversation and it was brought up that there are translation dollars encapsulated in the budget as it is moving forward. In, um, uh, centered around the pupil center funding formula and all the other education items that we are going through in the uh, budget subcommittees on education. So with that, are there any questions on Assembly Bill 194? Not seeing any questions. With that, I would accept a motion to do pass as amended from Ms. Benitez Thompson, a second from Dr. Titus. Questions or comments on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any in opposition? Hearing no opposition, passes unanimously of the members present and will assign bill to Ms. Torres to handle on the floor. That moving on to the next bill, Assembly Bill 231, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Assembly Bill 231, as amended, revises provisions governing education on the Holocaust and other genocides. 
Uh, section one of the bill creates a subcommittee to review and make recommendations on the manner in which to provide instruction uh, about the Holocaust and other genocides. Uh, the bill further indicates the subcommittee uh, shall link current standards with community resources that may assist in the instruction and review the manner in which the current standard supports comprehensive education regarding the Holocaust. Uh, the original uh, bill had four fiscal notes uh, submitted with local governments and the Nevada Department of a uh, Education identifying fiscal impacts. As amended, it appears uh, the fiscal impact for local governments had been addressed. However, according to the Nevada Department of Education, as amended, the bill would still cost the department approximately $4,000 over the biennium to provide technical support to the subcommittee. The uh, assemblywoman who testified in, uh, for this bill was Assemblywoman Cohen, and there were three individuals who uh, testified in support of this bill. Thank you, committee members. So with that, are there any questions or comments on Assembly Bill 231 at this time? Not seeing any, the chair would accept a motion to do pass as amended uh, Assembly Bill 231. I have a motion from Speaker Frierson, a second from Dr. Titus. Any questions or comments on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any in opposition? Hearing no opposition passes unanimously, the members present will hand this bill back to Assemblywoman Cohen to hand handle on the floor. I'm sure we would have had a lot of volunteers for that one. So uh, moving on to our next bill, uh, Ms. Kaufman, I believe we have Assembly Bill 278. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Assembly Bill 278, as amended, requires the Department of Health and Human Services to develop and make available to the Board of Medical Examiners the, and the State Board of Osteopathic Medicine a data uh, request to be administered to applicants for the renewal of a license or biennial registration. The uh, Division of Public and Behavioral Health had a fiscal note, however, they confirmed on the record uh, that with the amendment, there is no longer fiscal impact. Uh, the Assemblywoman who testified or presented on this bill was Assemblywoman Duran. They were uh, two individuals who identified um, who were in support of this bill and one individual who testified in the neutral on this bill. Thank you very much, Ms. Kaufman. Are there any questions from any committee, committee members on Assembly Bill 278? The fiscal note has been removed. Seeing none, I would accept a motion to do pass as amended from Ms. Bedinas Thompson, a second from uh, Assemblywoman Monroe Moreno. Questions or comments? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. And those in opposition? Aye. I have one nay from Dr. Titus. Uh, so with that motion passes, we will give this back to Ms. Duran to handle on the floor. To our next bill, which would be Assembly Bill 356. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Assembly Bill 356 um, relates to water prohibiting, with the certain exceptions, the use of water from the Colorado River to irrigate non-functional turf on uh, certain properties requiring the Board of Directors of Southern Nevada Water Authority to develop a plan for the removal of non-functional turf on certain properties, creating and setting forth the duties of non-functional turf Removal Advisory, uh, Non-Turf Re Removal Advisory Committee requiring the Legislative Committee on Public Lands to conduct a study concerning the water uh, conservation and providing other matters related there too. Um, Sen Assemblyman Watts uh, test uh, presented on this bill. Um, the uh, fiscal impact uh, was related to uh, uh, determination as to whether or not the LCB needed to fund a study and uh, during the testimony it was indicated that this would be part of the normal duties of the committee. 
There were four individuals that, or excuse me, three individuals that um, testified in support of this bill and zero in opposition, zero in neutral. Okay, committee members with that, um, looking at the first reprint making sure that we're good I think so so with that uh, the discussion with some Amen Watts was um, whether a, a letter of intent from ways to be sent to public lands or do we feel that a, a record has been sufficiently made that the Committee on Public Lands will address this issue uh, within their workload uh, during the next interim. Mr. Watts. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd, I would defer to others. Um, again, the intent is clear that this is uh, to be conducted within the normal course of uh, the interim uh, Committee on Public Lands uh, uh, meetings and, and responsibilities. But uh, if other members believe a, a letter of intent is required in addition to the record set today, I'm more than open to that. Okay. And it states at the, on the beginning of Section 42 that the committee will conduct a study um, on that. So I, I think we're pretty clear. I hate to do too many letters of intent because then I got to keep track of them through the interim. So um, I don't think that would really be necessary. And if we feel we need to make another adjustment in the other house, we can always address it there if necessary. So with that, I don't believe there would be any proposed amendments or letters of intent. Any other questions or comments from any other committee members on Assembly Bill 356? This would be a due pass as amended also since it is working off of a first reprint. Not seeing any questions or comments. So with that, I would accept a motion to do pass as amended from Ms. Benitez Thompson, a second from Ms. Peters. Any questions or comments on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any in opposition? Hearing none, passes unanimously of the members present. And we'll just hand this one back to Mr. Watts to take care of. You're welcome. So, committee members, I believe that leaves the, the two bills left that we still had some questions. The, the one bill we still have a few questions on, um, and we'll continue to work with Ms. Peters. And when is the appropriate time for Assembly Bill 348, we will put it on its path. So with that, I don't believe we have any other business before us this evening. We will go to our last agenda item, which is public comment. So broadcast services, we will give it a moment to queue a public comment, and then we will begin. So everyone just stand at ease for a moment. Caller with the last three digits, 490, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Yes, Cyrus Hojati, C-Y-R-U-S-H-O-J-J-A-T-Y. Well, let's just point out that uh, a lot of great bills have been passed. Uh, great to see that there's unanimous approval. I have thought about one idea or a possible bill that would really fix a lot of the problems, not just in the state, but perhaps this country and around the world. 
a former comedian, and he passed away several years ago, Robin, Robin Williams, mentioned it very well. Politicians should wear sponsor jackets like NASCAR drivers, and then we know who owns them. I think if we were to pass this policy here in Nevada, this would be a wonderful revolutionary and game changer for our state. I think it would be great to see that if a candidate is getting some amount of donor money from special interest group that exceeds a very high amount, that those logos of those PACs and corporation special interest groups should be labeled on the outfits that they are wearing so we can see who they work for. And this will encourage folks not to get a lot of dark money, and we make sure that we have a government that works for the people, by the people, not just a handful of billionaires, special interest groups, and corporations. I'm going to be working very, very hard to spread this idea to make sure that we get true representation. Thank you so much, and best of luck to you all. Broadcast services, are there any other callers on the line? Chair, the public comment line is open and working. However, we have no more callers at this time. Thank you very much, Broadcast Services, for all of your hard work and helping us be successful as we manage the new world of these meetings. Committee members, thank you for your attention this evening. A uh, number of bills were heard and processed and heading to the floor, so we're, we're on our way. And thank you again, Speaker, for allowing us to process these bills this evening. So with that there will be no Wednesday night ways, but there will be a Thursday night subcommittee hearing. Uh, next week, committee members, please expect possibly two evening meetings, depending upon our workload. So with that, we are adjourned.